Good morning or afternoon, uh, wherever today's session may find you. Uh, my name is Sarah Ruhi. I'm the Director for Strategic Partnerships at PLOS, and I'm delighted to kick off our CNI Fall uh, Membership Project Brief on um, a call to action, the imperative for libraries and publishers to better share and understand the APC waiver process. My co-panelists are Romy Beard from Eiffel and Curtis Brundy from Iowa State, and we'll be spending the next uh, 20 minutes or so walking you uh, through this process, sharing a bit more information about challenges and hopefully inspiring uh, everyone to some new actions uh, in the coming year. With that, I'll hand it over to you, Romy. Thanks, Sarah. So as Sarah said, my name is Romy Beard. I'm the Eiffel Licensing Program Manager. For those of you that aren't familiar with Eiffel, this is a not-for-profit organization that works with libraries and library consortia in developing and transition economy countries. And in my talk, I'll focus really on the painfulness of the waiver process. Um, and I'll take you through some examples of what this involves for authors. So what are the issues with current waiver programs? Um, first of all, it's an issue of lack of communication and non-automatic application of waivers. Um, authors really need to know in advance if, they, if waivers are available so they can claim them. And it's not always clear on publishers' websites. For example, there's no title list that can be searched. Often it's a blanket statement that applies, for example, to publishers, fully open access journals. But then if you look at the details of those journals, there's maybe one or two that are excluded because they're owned by societies. So it's not always very clear. Um, often there's no information on the individual journal websites or and or no information during the submission process. So the author needs to know what they need to do rather than it, they're prompted to do something. Often the terms aren't fair uh, for some countries um, where there's no funding opportunities and very low salaries. Um, discounts just aren't good enough. If you earn $400 a month, um, you've been asked to pay 50% of a $2,000 APC, it's not really feasible. Then we've accounted issues where the terms change suddenly. Um, countries are moved from waiver to discount categories, which again isn't fair on researchers who might be preparing to submit to a journal, expect a waiver, and then suddenly they're faced with a 50% discounted APC, which is still way too expensive for them. And most of these programs um, exclude hybrid journals, which is then pushing authors to publish in closed access in those specific journals, which is not making open making um, it equitable for them to publish in open, open access. I think there should be equal opportunities to publish in any journals. So we really think those um, journals should be included in the waiver programs. Um, so I'll take you through some examples. This is an example from um, Wiley's website, which has a big heading that says automatic waivers. And then if you look just a couple of lines underneath, it states that corresponding author needs to request the waiver, which <laughs> I think is, is wrong. If it's automatic, it should be automatically applied and they shouldn't request um, have to request anything. Um, then um, here's an example from a study we've done at Eiffel. So Eiffel traditionally used to negotiate um, agreements with publishers for access to paywalled content. But over the last couple of years, we've also been doing open access agreements with publishers. So these include waivers, um, discounts, but also read and publish agreements, including some free read and publish agreements with some of the smaller society publishers. And we've done an analysis this year where we looked at publishing output with four publishers, um, Cambridge, De Gruyter, Sage and Taylor and Francis, um, where we've had agreement in place and compared 2019 with 2020 publishing output for those eligible journals. And the positive thing is that we saw that the OA output um, increased as a result of our agreements, which is great, but also there were a number of issues. Um, Firstly, there were some articles that we found that were published in closed access in a hybrid journal, despite um, being eligible for a discount. So this really exemplifies um, what I mentioned earlier, that in some cases, discounts just aren't enough. So if I'm faced in a hybrid journal with a choice of, do I pay 50% discount or do I not pay and it goes in closed access? In many cases, unfortunately, authors that aren't able to pay will publish in closed access. Um, there's also examples of articles that were published in closed access in hybrid journals, despite being eligible for full waiver. 
um, it's just really, <laughs> really terrible. But again, this was an issue of automatic um, recognition not being available with this particular publisher. So the author had to email um, the editor at a journal. They had to know about this. And if they didn't, obviously, the article remained closed access. Um, so we can see here that this process complicates it for authors and it acts as a hurdle to open access. We've also saw examples of articles that were published in closed access despite being el eligible for open access to do read and publish. Um, mostly, I think that was, again, a lack of communication um, and not being offered as the default option in this case. I've also been part of the OA 2020 working group on lower middle income countries. Um, the, the aim of the, the group was to do a study looking at the potential for an impact of transformative agreements in lower middle income countries. And we focused on four countries, Ghana, Kenya, Ukraine, uh, Ukraine and Georgia, and on the publishing output with three publishers. And as part of the study, we contacted authors to ask them about their APC spend. Did you get a waiver? Did you get a discount? How much did you pay? Who paid? Um, and there's a variety of conclusions that we've drawn um, that other people have talked about. So I've just pulled out the conclusions here that relate specifically to the waiver programs. And most of them are the same as of what I've already mentioned also through the Eiffel study um, that published that discounts aren't um, good enough, that discounts change, that policies changed, um, and that um, also we find that authors um, make their decision on where to publish based on whether a waiver is available or not. So that's something else to bear in mind. And we've got a couple of um, author quotes here that talk about how painful a task it is to claim to claim waivers because there's so much back and forth um, if it's really like a, making a request rather than just ticking a box. Um, and also the last quote at the bottom there, the author that told us we didn't pay any charges, we got a waiver. If they didn't waive the charges, we would have published it elsewhere. And I think that's something publishers need to be aware of. Um, so what can we, can we do about this um, in terms of a call to action? For publishers, I'd really encourage them to you know, have clear communication on waivers and discounts on their website, a general page, but also a downloadable title list of eligible journals to make it easier for authors. And ideally, this should be searchable by subject and also include information like impact factors, which are still very important for researchers in developing countries. Um, also include information on each journal's website. Um, I know a lot of publishers are working on the automatic recognition and that is happening more and more. So if they're not doing it, they really should. Um, I would also say make it clear how long the terms you're offering for are, are valid for. So perhaps say this is an annual thing, it might change at the end of the year, just so it's really clear and it, there's no sudden changes. Suddenly researchers from Ghana are expected um, to have a discount rather than get a full waiver. Um, and then another important point is Instead of just following um, groups um, of already like allocated country groups, perhaps do your own research to find out what is real realistic, if there is funding available or not in certain countries. Uh, and by all means, include hybrid journals. Um, when it comes to library and consortia, and I know Curtis will talk more about this, um, if you're having discussions with publishers about the equity of their waiver programs, please get them to act on these recommendations. Um, and include that in your discussions to leverage it. That's everything for me and I'll hand over um, back to you, Sarah. Thanks, can you guys see my screen okay and hear me okay? Great. Yep. Um, thank you, Romy. That was such a good introduction to the similar challenges uh, that we're seeing on our side of, at PLOS as a publisher. Um, so just a brief reminder, if you're less familiar about PLOS, uh, we've been doing um, native OA, gold, open access since the early 2000s. Everything we publish is open access CCBY. Um, we've been seven titles for a long time, but recently launched five this year. So um, a much bigger portfolio now than we've had in the past. And everything that we publish is really predicated on best practice, both around um, open access, but also open science, um, open research. Every uh, title as well is funded both by individual APCs that authors or institutions can pay, as well as um, models that don't involve any APCs at all and waiver uh, mechanisms to support authors 
um, if they don't have funding for APCs. That said, um, waivers on the publisher side are just as challenging, certainly from PLOS's perspective, uh, as they seem to be for authors. Uh, they're incredibly resource intensive to manage. Um, they're often quite subjective. I mean, we, we, we have standards around how we, you know, determine if, if needs uh, have been evidenced to justify a waiver, but obviously a person is making that choice and to some extent um, there's an arbitrary element to it. Uh, over the long term, it's not sustainable. The demand always outpaces what we can um, support. Uh, it's difficult to track and manage. Um, communications with authors, it's difficult to get them to respond. So a lot of energy and resources spent around just the, the wrangling of, of information. And fundamentally, they don't just address the systemic issue, right? There's a reason authors can't pay APCs, uh, and this is just kind of a Band-Aid. Um, and I think when PLOS started, we overestimated the ability of, of a waiver program to address the equity issue around um, access to funds to publish. And uh, so now we're really recognizing that fundamentally waivers aren't equitable. So just to make sure we're clear on what we mean by equity here, this is the typical image that's used to explain the difference between equality versus equity, right? We tend to argue that the scientific process, the communications process should be equal, uh, but fundamentally equality is not enough when there are systemic things that make it tough for the shortest person on the box to ever see over the fence. So if you wanted to use the metaphor that uh, the baseball game or the game that they're watching is kind of any aspect of the creation of, of knowledge, uh, whether it's accessibility, dissemination, data, whatever. Uh, and if you think of the fence as any barrier to participation, generally speaking, there's a community of folks for whom the fence is not an issue, they're invested in it, they, they've they never had problems with it, uh, it works for them. And then there's just sort of everyone else. And what waivers really speak to in a, a lot of cases are the, the cases that are popping up here on the screen, whether it's your geographic location, your, uh, your, your research field, your phase of your career, um, all of that uh, is we're trying to address with waivers, but fundamentally the problem, right, is systemic. So until we address that question, something like a waiver program is just never going to be enough. And that's what we're trying to figure out at PLOS. So just to give you a sense of how arduous it is from the author side, um, the author experience tends to be uh, limited to some extent by the submission process. Uh, in our case, we need to know this information at submission. So there's quite a lengthy section on any of our pages around how you can get support for an APC. So as you can see, already a lot of text that authors have to read. On top of that, um, they have to uh, decide which waiver program they want to participate in, fee assistance, or our global participation initiative. Um, then they have to follow all of these steps. If they choose the global participation initiative, it's relatively easy. If they choose the route of um, publication uh, funding assistance, there are a lot more steps that we ask them to, to make. There's a lot more we ask them to read. Um, and then we ask them many, many times, you know, are you sure you have no other way to pay for funding? Um, because this is essentially us paying for their paper if, if we choose to um, cover their fees for them. And in most cases, we can't cover the entire fee. We, we do some combination of uh, reduced fees. Uh, to spread the money around as much as we can, which again is frustrating for everyone because if you have some cases, it doesn't matter if the fee is $2,000 or $200. If there's no money, there's no money. In other cases, a discount is, is good, but it's, it's, it's not enough. Um, so the lift for PLOS is considerable. So, the, so we make the author do all of that. And then on our side, um, we're just dealing with the challenges of engaging with authors to get the information we need. It's a means-tested um, uh, program in the case of, of our uh, publication funding assistance program. So we need to see the evidence. Um, so that process is hard to make wholly positive when you're kind of constantly chasing the author for, for information uh, or questions you have about their application. The internal systems we have are not yet super well connected. So, um, uh, you know, an author may be applying for a waiver when they're already eligible uh, through an institutional agreement. Um, but sometimes that falls through the cracks. So we're actually giving a waiver when an author was already covered through an agreement. That doesn't happen a lot, but from time to time. So there's a lot of, um, to Romy's point, automation that could bring real, uh, uh, could imp dramatically improve this experience that we we haven't effectively, we're, we're working to build now, but isn't in place. 
Um, and then, of course, you have a lot of folks who um, have no issue with the APC when they apply, but by the time their paper is accepted, um, they, their funding is gone. And so you have a difficult situation where post acceptance a waiver is needed. And in many cases, because the author um, has no mechanism to get that funding, we just end up taking that on as bad debt when an author just doesn't pay for a paper. So there's a lot of things that can be improved. We're working on them, but but the the overall experience isn't great on either side, which really makes the case for moving away from them. So in terms of an overall picture of our waiver uh, uh, outcomes in the last four or five years, the vast majority are approved, as I said, largely uh, through discounts, not complete elimination of the fee. If they're denied, um, it's usually because they either haven't ever gotten back to us with the um, evidence that we've requested, um, or they've realized they do have funds um, and just we've realized they've had funds and, and they weren't aware of it. Uh, so the vast majority we, we do try to accept, but it's never at the amounts that that folks want. Um, that said, uh, if we are treating waivers, which we are right now, as a kind of intermediary solution to a final destination that we hope moves away from this model entirely, the numbers are going in the right direction. So if you're looking at our fee assistance um, over time by region, uh, we've we're, we're dramatically reducing the amount of assistance that we can do in sort of global North countries and really increasing, you know, research for life, South and Central America um, and Africa, the African continent and the Middle East. This is not to say that there is not need in North America, Europe, Asia Pacific, there is, and again, researchers at early career, researchers in fields with no funding, researchers that aren't at institutions. But if we have to make a call with limited resources, our inclination is to shift towards um, uh, ge ge geographies that are un underrepresented at PLOS. Um, next slide. So fee assistance um, by dollar amount uh, is reflecting the same thing. So uh, the money that we're spending for uh, those underrepresented communities is going up. It's diminishing uh, in global North countries. Uh, so moving in the right direction, but overall the amount of money available obviously is going down, which, which brings us back to the same challenge. And then if you look at distribution over um, uh, subject area, one of the things that is notable about this in 2020 is you could ask yourself, well, why are the 2020 um, number of waivers reduced? And what what, I'm, what we think happened, we're still kind of unpacking this, is because 2020 was such a strange year, we actually granted fewer waivers, but higher dollar amounts um, where possible because discounts weren't going to move the needle for a lot of authors. So we didn't grant as many individual waivers, but each represented a deeper discount off of the, um, the actual fee. And so the call to action that we would bring to this conversation, both to libraries and vendors and other publishers, is there's really more stakeholders uh, in the community and, and involved in this process than authors and publishers. And so solutions really need to reflect that. Funders need to be active stakeholders. Institutions need to be stakeholders. There's a lot of other folks that could could help with this, and that's what PLOS's new business models are trying to, to um, synthesize. Similarly, solutions that help whole regions, whole organizations, and not just one author are going to shift um, the, 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 the systems more uh, equitably than sort of individual, you get a waiver, you get a waiver, you get a waiver. If we, if we really want to see systemic change, um, broader, broader uh, solutions for groups are going to be important. Um, when you make things means tested or means based, um, it's it's a really challenging thing to do it in a way that feels objective and fair. Um, and ideally, the amount of friction that we we generate for authors should be less uh, than what the waiver process currently brings, which, um, as I showed you, is quite quite labor intensive. So happy to hand it over now to um, uh, to to Curtis to to reinforce uh, some of the things libraries can do to help us with this. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Sarah, and, and thanks, Romy. I think that that was a great overview of the the problem that we're facing. And what what I'm going to do with with my time is focus in on you know what is the role of the academic library in all of this. And I think that academic libraries have kind of been on the sideline uh, in the development of waiver programs. I don't think it's until we really started making open access agreements that this became something that we're, we're paying more attention to. So 
just real quick, I want to talk just a little bit about Iowa State, because I think the approach that we're taking could be a model for other libraries to take and how they're thinking about this. So we're a library that is committed to transitioning our subscription spend to open access. We're a public land grant university. Our mission is to not just create and apply knowledge, but to share it to make Iowa and the world better places. And what you're looking at here is a in this bar chart is the amount of open access articles that are being centrally covered uh, by the library. And just in three years, you can see the growth trend here. And we really are at a point in time right now with the number of publishers that are adopting open models, where over the span of one renewal season, a library could make a significant shift in their, their spending from subscriptions to these open access models. But these open access models do include the APC-based um, models. So the read and publish that Cambridge is doing, the read and publish that Wiley is doing. If a library wants to support the native pure OA publishers like Iowa State is doing, we pay, for example, to cover our authors um, publishing in PLOS One. We pay for them to publish in Frontiers. Um, so these waiver programs are an actual huge issue because we are committed to um, inequitable and sustainable transition to open. And I think all of the problems that, that Romy and Sarah have pointed out with these waiver programs are a problem. And it's a pressing and it's an urgent problem that we need to address. So I'm going to talk just briefly about some things that I think that the, that the libraries can do. And one of these is um, working toward having an, a, a waiver program expectation clause. And what you have here, if you don't try to read this, this has nothing to do with waiver programs. This is actually an accessibility clause. But you can see that we can get quite detailed in what we ask publishers to include around things that we care about. And and for Iowa State, waiver programs are now one of those things that we want to have this conversation during our negotiation. We were just on the phone with, with Wiley this week, and we talked probably for 20% of the time about their waiver program and how they can improve their waiver program, and we're going to be doing more of that. But I think to really inform what a clause like this might look like, we actually have to convene a community conversation. I think that um, Romy shared out, you know, a bunch of concrete things that publishers can do, but I think taking that a step forward, this idea of convening a conversation, it's an inclusive conversation with authors who are actually having to request these and use these programs, you know, with not just Northern libraries driving the conversation, but pulling in our colleagues from, you know, low and middle income countries, for example, to have this conversation. I, I think out of that, I think we can actually pin down what are the best practices? What are the standards for these? And then pulling it back to our negotiations and getting this embedded in our contracts that we're going to hold publishers to actually doing this. And I fully agree with what Sarah said that, you know, when we're doing waiver programs on the back end to address equity problems, because on the front end, we haven't implemented a model that is equitable from the start, um, but that's an issue. And I subscribe to open. I think what PLOS is doing with their CAP model, I think what Lyricist is doing with the OACIP, Open Library of Humanities with the cooperative models, we do have models now that have equity baked in and don't require a Band-Aid fix on the back end. But the reality is APCs are going to be here with us for some time. Read and publish style agreements are going to be with us for some time. So it is pressing. It is urgent that we figure out how to make these programs the best that they can be for all of the reasons that Sarah and Romy have, have talked about. So again, libraries, I think now that we are making open access agreements, we are part of this conversation. And I think we can push this forward. And so Sarah and I and, and Romy are, are, are talking about this all over. I think that what we're trying to do is stimulate a conversation. I think you will see perhaps opportunities for participation in, in conversations on how we improve these programs um, next year. So keep an eye out for that. And thank you very much for your, your time and attention. Great, fantastic. Um, we will close with sharing our information again. I guess I can pop the slide up that has our contact information. Actually, I don't have it. So I will um, circulate our information for anyone who wants to get in touch with us after this session. We are looking forward to questions and feedback and uh, wishing everyone a great rest of the CNI virtual and in-person uh, conference. Thanks, Romy. Thanks, Curtis. Bye. Thanks.